you would please turn in your Bible to James chapter 5, if you don't have your Bible with you today, you can use a pew Bible, and that would be on page 1013, and would you please stand, James chapter 5, come now you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You may be seated. Well, what a encouragement and blessing to hear from these young people and their sponsors and just how God worked and continues to do work um, in and through uh, his word, but also in and through the fellowship of believers. It's so important. So let's pray as we're uh, heading into the word again. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for another opportunity to open your word and as we're wrapping up this letter uh, from your son's half-brother here that uh, God you would just use it in how you see fit and uh, thank you again for this time together in Jesus name amen well our Missourian brother James who is from uh, the show me state of uh, his heart, uh, a heart that said, I want you to show me your faith. 
uh, by your works. Uh, it's a calling on each of our lives that when we're living this Christian life, it isn't just this, but it literally is lived, lived out by our actions. And we're proving to people that we're believers by those actions. Uh, by the time your funeral would happen, that it wouldn't be one of those things that as I am preaching it or somebody else is preaching it, they're not having to come up with material that would uh, encourage the people that are there that this person that is being represented, this person that is being memorialized that day uh, would have given enough evidence to show others that they are a believer as opposed to, he's a good guy. He didn't kill anybody, you know. And uh, instead it would be this person was evidentially a, a person that uh, loved the Lord and loved the Lord's people. And those are the callings uh, in our lives. And so as James is continuing where he left off in chapter 2. Here in chapter 5, he's attempting to do uh, what his half-brother Jesus had done when he cleaned up the temple, as he cleans house concerning wealthy people. And I want to just put it out before you that if you're in America, you are one of the wealthy people. Uh, compared to the rest of the world, we are extremely blessed. And some of us here are more blessed than others, but it, the reality is that we all have um, a lot. And so this passage of Scripture, as Don has already read it for us, is convicting enough as it is. And I want to just encourage you that once again, this is the Word of God. This is, this is Him telling us um, what we need to hear. And doing this, doing this thing that James has presented to us. It's not hard to preach James. It's kind of like when you have put together a meal, you ladies that put together a roast, and that thing just opens up, and you're, I'm going to lose you in a second talking like this. But you know what I'm saying where it's like, wow, this is just, it just there. The hard part is living this out. And instead of when we're seeing these things, instead of saying, boy, I wish my husband were here. I wish my wife was here. Boy, they need this. It would be, it's me. It's me, oh Lord. This has been hitting me. Uh, I was at times as I am changed gears to, to do this series, I was like, what did I do? I, uh, this is convicting. This is, this is hard stuff to hear. And so we're... We're in the fifth chapter here. We're wrapping it up. And so point number one, if you want to take notes in the back of your bulletin, there's a spot there. Point number one, notice the selfish. Notice the selfish. And note, he's going to be addressing here the rich that are playing church. The rich people that are playing church. Look at verse one again with me. Come now. So you think about that as he's writing this letter, that when he would say things, when writers say things, I beseech you, or behold, it, it's, oh, listen up. He's saying, come now. Now, when I would hear my teacher say that, come now, I'd be like, oh boy, this is going to be serious stuff. Come now, you rich, weep, and look at this next word, and howl. I guess that's what, somebody up on a rope would be doing, howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. So this rich are those who have more than they need to live. That's all of us here. He's get, trying to get our attention. They're not condemned because they're wealthy. Understand that. Being wealthy is not sinful. It's does your wealth have you. It's not that you have wealth. Does your wealth have you? And these are individuals that are misusing the resources. Their God is their money. Look at verses 2 and 3. Your riches have rotted 
and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Now, those pictures are rough, rotted, and, and, and moth-eaten, and, and corroded. So he's pointing out the folly of hoarding. Hoarding food and expensive clothing or money and all of these things are subject to decay. They're subject to theft. They're subject to fire or other ways of losing, loss. And he's saying in these last days, and that's the time between Christ's first and second coming. He's rebuking the rich for living as if Jesus were never coming back. Their whole thing is their money. They cannot stop thinking about it. And that kind of thinking affects every way they view people, view life, view success, view what really matters. It's all driven by that. And God is saying to you and me, I don't want you to live that way. I don't want you, and, and it would be so tempting because you know people that have more than you. You just know. If you haven't, then there's an old show called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous with Robin Leach, and he would show you these things. And why do people watch those things? There's something about it. Back in the day, there was a show on MTV called Cribs. And it isn't about baby stuff. But it's about what, how a person lives and, and what they value. And there's something about those shows that just draw us in and allow us to have this thing called coveting. Or if I had that, then I'd do this. I've met people before. If I had this, then I would do this. Are you doing any of that now? Well, no, because I don't have that. Then you won't do it when you get that. Because how you are with a little, all a lot does is shine a greater light on what you're like with that little bit. Take it from me. I've had individuals I've known that won the lottery. And it just, and you've heard the stories. Well, if I just did that, how are you with what you have now? Look at verse 4. Behold, he's, one, he's shining a light on how these individuals think. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. And so there's individuals that have money, they have power, and they hired people that they should be taking care of better, they know, and they kept back because they got a deal. They used that person. You ever meet somebody that cannot go to purchase something without getting a deal? And they're always bragging about that. Some, and some of you are like, yeah, I do that. Got a friend, he's always got to get a throw in. Yeah. Got to get a throw in on what he gets. And then he comes back and he's like, and I'll even ask him, I go, what's the throw in? And he's like, oh man, you should have seen what I got. And some of you are like, this is like my only competition. I don't do sports. This is my thing. Don't take it from me. But if you're always trying to do that instead of doing what is best. If you get a job done and you're like, and you walk away from them and you're like, oh man, you should. And it's almost like you burned that person to get what you got. There's, there's nothing wrong with, what is that thing called? Bar, what is it? Um, when you what, negotiate. <laughs> Some people call it negotiating. I like, there's other words for it. Yeah, just the, the, just the game that could go on. And there's nothing wrong with it, but when it becomes something where 
you're, you know you're taking advantage of somebody, there's a problem here. As long as I never get burned. I'll burn everybody else, but as long as I don't get burned. And he's saying that I want you to be people that don't think like that, that that's not your obsession, but that you'd be fair with people. And these aren't. These people aren't being that way. They're taking advantage of people. Money that should have been paid, they now have it. And I've heard people before that would say to me, well, you know that's why they're rich. Oh, they're, they're a jerk? They're, they're ma- manipulative? God is saying to you and me as Christians, we shouldn't be that way. And he says... It's so much the case that the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. God sees. He's aware when we take advantage of people. And so this is, God's, these are wages, these were kept back. You've made your money because you paid poor wages. You've made your fortune on the expense, at the expense of others. And God will take care of that situation. Isn't it good that we know that God will take care of it? Sometimes I think like this, they're getting away with it. They're not. Look at verse 5. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Luxury and self-indulgence. After stealing from these workers, the rich indulge themselves with those monies. And that luxury is is wanton pleasure. And this self-indulgence means no self-denial. If I can get it, I'll get it. I deserve that. In that day of slaughter, they've indulged themselves to the limit. And God says, I don't want you to think like that, Christians. I don't want you to live like that. It goes on, verse 6. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. It was condemned and mur- The next step in this sinful progression of the rich, a hoarding that led to fraud, which led to self-indulgence, and, and this condemned, there's a sentence here, and Jesus is stressing that wealth is not an advantage, and it can be a spiritual handicap. Look at what Jesus, he talks about this. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Luke 12, verse 15. And he said to them, take care. And be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. There's a rich man that came to Jesus in Mark 10, beginning at verse 22. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus was direct with him. And Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. You know why they were amazed at his words? In the Jewish mind, wealth meant blessing. And Jesus just blew their minds how he would talk. This isn't all that matters. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. You know how it is. The more we get, the more independent we are. That's why the greatest cure for greed is giving. Here's the amazing part about this whole thing. God doesn't need our money. Some of you are like, this is great. I love hearing this. Money is a, is a way that God shines the light on our hearts. For where our treasure is, that's where our heart will be also. And so if you don't give, 
God will provide somebody else to give. He's just, he's worked it that way. All it is, is it shows us, oh, that's my heart. That's the way I am. That's why I'm like that. If we're willing to think about it the way James puts it before us. And those are hard words, hoarding that would lead to fraud, that would lead to self-indulgence, that would ultimately lead to murder. God doesn't waste words. Point number two as we're working through this together. Notice the suffering. And now it almost seems like he's now moved from people that were faking it, that weren't necessarily believers, but they'd go to church because it, was a, uh, it looked good and I could get business contacts. I've, the things I've heard from people about why people go to church, it's amazing. But he's going to deal now with true believers, and he says here, be patient, therefore, brothers. So he's talking to those that are sitting there that go, I have been taken advantage by rich people, or I, I have been, and God's saying, be patient until the coming of the Lord. See how, the, and then he uses pictures again. Don't you love this? He's using pictures so you and I would understand. Well, I know we're not from a, an agrarian uh, culture for the most part, but we know what, this, what a farmer, we, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the, the late rains. He's saying to you and me, I, I want you to be patient. It's so easy to, to lose sight about the fact that it, life can be hard, especially patient. I want you to be patient with people. And that coming is the second coming. And those early and late rains, he's saying that the farmer has to bank on this. And as the farmer waits, we must wait. Look at verse 8. You also be patient. So he talked about being patient. Then he goes, you also be patient. So let me get this right. You want me to be doubly patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. I want you to, to, to I'm calling you to something resolute, and, and there's this firm courage and commitment that when you think about the idea of being resolute, establishing, it's I'm standing ready because life is hard, and understand that. And then he goes on and he says this, and this is, this is a good word for all of us. Do not grumble against one another. Some of you, if we're sitting here, we could sit here and go, well, I've never committed this sin, and you pick biggies. But are you a, are you a grumbler? Grumbling's easy. <laughs> Things aren't going on. He says, I don't want you to do that. So that you may not be judged. Well, I just, all I did was grumble. I don't want you grumbling. And then he says something that's really hard. The judge is standing at the door. Now get that picture. That's hand on the doorknob standing at the door. Jesus could come back at any time. I want you living as if Jesus could come back at any time. And that would have a bearing on how you behave. You're doing something you shouldn't, and you know somebody's on the other side of that door, and they could come in at any time. You can't lock the door. They can come in at any time. I don't want you grumbling. The judge is at the door. Verse 10. As an example of suffering and patient, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. So he would, he's pointing at the Old Testament. He's saying that this is what they, they would speak in the name of the Lord. And then he goes, Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. Remember a couple summers ago we went through Job together? And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And Job went through some hard stuff, but when we get to that last chapter, you see God took care of him. And he's saying to you and me, brothers and sisters, when it gets hard, be patient. The judge is at the door, and he'll, he'll work things out. 
And it's hard when you're in the middle of stuff. It is so hard when you're in the middle of stuff. But I could go around this room probably and testimony after testimony about how God showed up. But right now you're in the midst of it and you're like, I, and my word to you is trust him. It isn't easy, but trust him. Point number three, notice the swearing. Notice the swearing. Look at verse 12. But above all, my brothers... Do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. He's saying, I don't want you to play that game. Seriously, honestly, this is the honest truth. And you hear people say, have you been lying all the way up to this point? Sounds like his half-brother Jesus here. Matthew 5, verse 37. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You start explaining things more and more. Oh, there's something more to this as opposed to yes or no. Say what you mean and mean what you say. These are all practical things. This is that beef opening up for us. It's a matter of doing it, though. It's a matter of trusting him. It's a matter of going there. Look at uh, point number four. Notice the supplication. Notice the supplication. Look at verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. And this, the antidote in seeking God's comfort through prayer if you're suffering. Let him sing. That's a natural response here. Look at verses 14 and 15. He goes on and he says, Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And we've had at the church here, because we want to line up with Scripture, we've had people that will approach myself or one of the elders, and that's the biblical thing. I want you to know this. There's a calling on our lives when it comes to this. We take this passage seriously that there'll be people that would say, hey, would you pray over me? Would you anoint? We've got, I've got a, this isn't make it anything fancy. This is what I keep it in, a little bit of oil in my office. Nothing magical about it. But if the scripture says to do this, I'm going to do this. It's vegetable oil, all right? But we do this, and we've prayed over people. And we've anointed them with oil. We've, we've prayed over them because this is what the Bible says. And I'm going to trust the word on this one. And it's offer, offered on the behalf of this person by the elders. And we're always open to doing that. Because we believe God heals. We don't heal. That oil doesn't heal. God heals. But I'm not going to, well, he says that, but we're going to go with what he says. And we could, we could stay on that verse. And most of the time when people work through James 5, they stay on that verse. But I want you to notice there's a bunch of things here he's been talking about. And the next verse is just as powerful. Because a lot of times when it comes to prayer, we pray for all of those things. And those, it's not bad. Hey, my uncle, he's sick. My aunt, she's dealing with this. But these next verses are in James 5 too. 5 also. Look at this. Um, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. I think a lot of reason why people are sick today is there's sin in their life. And they're hiding it. And they're wondering why this is affecting them emotionally. And then listen, this the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Confess. That's that natural or that mutual honesty. That's that openness. That's the sharing of needs. That's an understanding of that word sin is false. And I'm telling you, women are better at this than men. Men, we're wired, we're fixers. Most of the time, we're fixers. 
And if I were to ask a lot of women, is there somebody you're praying? Yeah, I've got a, she's great. I talk to her and we pray about stuff and I share. If I were to ask men in the room right now, is there someone, another man in your life that you know you can talk to them and you do this, you actually confess sin? Is there anybody like that in your life? And if there isn't, I'm, I'm pleading with you to have somebody because this isn't in the Bible by accident. And what I see is the years go by, I can handle it. Or I can, and then this is the thing that you see years later and there's a guy that starts acting interesting. They get some Grecian formula, they unbutton their shirt to about here and they get gold chains and they have this midlife crisis. Now they want the, the new lady. Dude, you're messed up. It's not the answer. There's so much regret down the road as opposed to here and now taking this admonition seriously and go, I don't want this to be the case in my life. And you hide. And sin just grows in that atmosphere. And God is saying, I want you to be a confessing person. Not everybody, not, you know, you know now you mentioned it, Pastor. Tell the whole. But finding somebody you can trust that's also humble. I don't know if you've ever opened up to a group or opened up to an individual, and then the next time, so how you doing with that thing? And you're like, oh, I want to talk to you about it. Do you guys, are you hearing me? I know I'm beating this drum here, but I want you to hear me. This is huge. Finding someone that you live this out in. I think I thoroughly beat that one, all right? I think, I hope you got that, all right? Verse 17 and 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. And I want you to just stick with this for a second. We'll go a few minutes over. Stay with me, please. But we see here, he, of all the people that he picks in the Old Testament, he picks a story from a rough time in Israel's life. Remember who's in charge in Israel when Elijah's? They got this like mealy mouth, weak kneed king named Ahab, and his wife is basically in charge. Phoenician princess named Jezebel, which I don't know how many, have you met any Jezebels? People don't go, you know, I'm going to name my daughter Jezebel. You don't do that. Why? Because of what she was. She was horrible. It was a horrible time. And Elijah starts to pray, and see how he prays? He doesn't go, Lord, bless our times. Bless our nation. He prays rough stuff on Israel. God, would you stop rain from falling? I've never heard, I've never heard, that somebody says, hey, let's pray for a depression or an inflation. Well, we got it. But uh, <laughs> Or even in the lives of our family where God needs to work. We just want, oh, I don't want to pray that. But pray, God, even praying God's will. But it's almost like this kid of yours isn't walking with God. This person, and you, and you, you pray, oh, God. Please take care of it, but don't hurt him like he's mean and you know better. Praying God's will, and he might start doing some stuff to wake that individual up. That's the prayer of Elijah. That's powerful. And then God, he prays again, and God doesn't work. And it's an understanding that prayer is the greatest thing that we can do for one another. Instead of going, well, the least I can do is pray. You think, think about that sentence. The least I can do is pray. The least you can do? God can move in lives. 
Revivals have been built out of that. By the way, all of the stuff I'm preaching to you, I've been preaching to myself all week. Because instead of, oh, pray about it, I'll just do it. Like I'm, like I'm more powerful. God is saying, I don't want you to live like that. Last point, point number five. Notice the soul winning. Look at verse 19. My brothers, boy, this is kind and loving. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. He's saying if there are people that are part of the church family that used to be a part of the church family and aren't anymore, and you and I need to go after them. And instead of looking at a situation go, you know, You'll see somebody sitting there and their, their spouse isn't there and you go, well, those things happen. It's just none of my business. Instead of going, they haven't been here for a few weeks. Instead of going, Pastor, you need to take care of it. But you have a relationship with that person that you would take the initiative and go, is everything okay? And I'm saying this because I love you. We go after people. We care because they're head, they, oh, they're just missing church. That's a big sign of something. That's evidence of something. Over the long haul, it's not good. You know what this is? I've got a picture here for you. You know what this is? You know what that is? If I say their name, you might know. Roy Regal. You ever Roy Regal? University of California. This is the Rose Bowl. Back in, uh, I think, January 1st, 1929, the Golden Bears are facing the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. You know who Roy Regal is? Roy Regal was the guy that was in the game, and a ball was fumbled, and he picked it up, and he just started running with it. The problem is he ran into somebody, and then he started going the wrong way. And he's running like 65 yards. And everybody's screaming. It's Rose Bowl. Everybody's going nuts. He had a friend that was a close friend named Benny Loam, who was faster than Roy because Roy's just this guy in the line. And he's happy as can be. He's like, I'm going to make it. I'm gonna, you know why he can make it? Because nobody's stopping him. They're lo- Georgia Tech's loving the fact that he's heading toward their place for a goal, for a touchdown. And he's running full speed. And his buddy, you see his buddy right there? <laughs> his buddy's right behind him trying to tell him, you're going the wrong way. But you see in the whole cr- he's hearing the whole crowd screaming. And he's thinking, this, this is pretty cool. Benny grabbed him at the one-yard line, and then the rest of his team just crunched him, baby. Benny loved him enough to stop him. (laughs) I'm saying that that's you or that's me at any time. You think, I would never do this. I could never do that. I know most people that have fallen into any sort of sin. How did I get here? And I'm saying you need to be Benny Loam to that person. Stop them. And you'll save them a multitude of sins. It's a calling on our lives. We're we're called to a ministry of reclamation. His nickname became Roy Wrong Way Regal. He, he He was so embarrassed. But it's better than if he scored. <laughs> Let's be that for one another, please. Lots in this chapter. Please do not walk out of here and allow the forgetfulness of whatever to push it aside. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your goodness and grace. God, continue doing your work in our lives. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.